if you're going to have a mega, because I don't have enough screens here. <laughs> and so you will give me a chance from yeah. my from Megan. Okay. Hi, guys. Yes. Is this uh, working? Scott, you Scott. are ready to go. Okay. Sorry. I, I, I was having a, a hard time getting in. I apologize for, for being a, a minute late or so. Um, all right. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll, call the, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us for tonight's Board of Education meeting. This is the June 29th uh, regularly scheduled meeting. If you would all please join me in rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United, States, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, and Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. All right. Uh, Phil, could you take roll, please? Yep. President McFarland. Here. Here. Vice President Singer. Here. Secretary Rauch is here. Treasurer Fidel. Double check if I don't see Mary. She's not um, here. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Lauterbach. Here. All right, we've got six, Scott. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we have a quorum. All right, we'll jump right into item number three. We do have a, a relatively busy agenda tonight. Uh, item number three is our consent agenda. That includes item 3.1 is the approval of the minutes June 28th, 2020 meeting. Uh, you also see we have item 3.2, which are teachers attaining tenure status. Uh, next is item three. Three, the following persons have announced their resignations uh, on the following dates. Those are, are itemized on the agenda. Item 3.4 is approved of the school bills for the month of May as listed in the chapter. Uh, amount of $6,120,996. And finally, 3.5 uh, approval is request to authorize legal payment to the Thrun Law Firm, amount of $510. Uh, for May 28th, 2020, legal uh, game prove the consent agenda, please. I'm sorry, was that? John and Pam. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, motion by John, support by Pam. Uh, any discussion, additions uh, before this? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? None. Okay. Passes. Um, next up, item four. We have presentations to the board. Uh, are we doing the, Mike, I'm sorry, it looks like we're doing 4.1 first. That is the budget amendment? Correct. Our final that's budget amendment. That's going to be Brian. Correct. Okay, Brian, 4.1, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. I appreciate it. Um, to give you all a reminder of where we are at in our timeline, this is our final action on our 2019-2020 budget. And after we are done with this amendment, we're going to ask you to approve the 2021 budget that we presented to you just a couple of weeks back. And to give you a reminder, uh, we did ask for an additional week extension uh, more than what our usual timeline is to be able to try and get the most accurate numbers that we possibly could. Um, and I'm going to preface this with a disclaimer that in that interim, we've heard almost absolutely nothing um, in terms of additional information. It, it just so happens that all of about 30 seconds ago, um, my email started lighting up with all kinds of information coming in from some of the state organizations on rumors of what would be happening um, but those are simply rumors and speculation at this time. So the numbers that I'm going to present to you tonight for our final amendment reflect what our 
college as of this date. And what we know as of this date is that we have not seen any official notice of a proration of our state aid for this year. So then I'm going to show you in the next slide, show funded that we must on um, that could change. We hope that it doesn't. And we get to sort through some of these room emails. We'll do so. And of course, oh, that time goes. So these are what we know today. It's highlight text it. And so in the um new time, um you are going at is to our fund balance at a proc. $1.7 million, what was a predicted deficit for the previous two months. Um, in the very top right, you'll see that we have added to our revenue expenditures to the tune of about $975,000 over the March amendment. That's largely due to our finalized FTE accounts that came in from the state. Our property taxes finally came in, so we have those actual numbers and also our final special education reimbursements came in, which made up that $975,000 increase. If you go to the second column, or the second row, excuse me, for the 1920 expenditures, you see a reduction in expenditures of about $804,699. Those reduction in expenditures, a lot of them were largely COVID-19 shutdown related. Reductions in supplies, gas, um, a lot of savings in substitute teacher costs, um, athletic bus routes, and those type of things. So that reduction um, of 804,000, coupled with the increase in revenues to 975,000 additional more, reduced our projected deficit from around 1.86 million to just right around $82,000 deficit. For those of you that have been around on the board for a while, you know that we always expect a budget variance at the end. Typically, we predict a 1.5% variance, but this year, due to the shutdown, we've changed that 1.5% to 2% to better reflect where we think we're going to come in at. And as of last Wednesday, when we had to prepare these numbers for you, we are predicting somewhere around $1.7 million positive for our general fund. Um, it is an odd year and we expect these numbers to change on us one more time. Um, just today, we got an email from an insurance company from our dental company giving us money back because of the lack of procedures that could be done. So that's gonna be increased revenues for us as well too that we got just this afternoon. So the budget flushes those out. We expect that number of 1.7 million to grow a bit. We'll know the actual growth in that once the audit is complete. But then in the same aspect, it could be reversed if the state does come through with a proration. So these numbers, while we are confident that we will add at this time, if there is a proration, depending on the amount of the proration, it could actually be a negative adjustment. So typically we're presenting you these numbers with a very high degree of confidence. I can present them to you with a high degree of confidence of what I know as of this second, but my degree of confidence that that's going to change is very um, positive that we're probably gonna see some degree of change as well too. So if these numbers do hold true for us, we are anticipating an increase to our unassigned fund balance to a grand total of about $19.6 million or 22.8% of expenditures. Um, if you put it all together, um, taking our unassigned and assigned fund balance, that would be at approximately 28.3% or $24.3 million. So that is positive budget news at this time. But again, we will give you finalized numbers once the audit comes. And please, again, forgive us if these numbers do change on us, if there is some degree of change of information from the state of Michigan. So that is our budget amendment, the final one that we have for this year. So I'll leave my presentation up. Um, Mr. McFarland, if you'd like to go in a vote on the budget amendment, then I will give you the update on our final 2021 after that. Okay. Uh Procedurally, do we need a roll call vote for this? No, no I didn't okay. think so. Just wanted to double check. Okay. Um, at this point, we'll take a motion uh, for approval of item 4.1. Motion to approve item 4.1. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, 
make a motion to approve item 4.1, the final budget amendment for the current school year. Support. support. Motion by Phil, uh, support by, I think it was Pam. Uh, any discussion on the budget amendment as presented by Mr. Bruton? No? Okay, uh, Brian, thank you for doing this. We will, at this point, take any good news we can get. So this is this is a, a welcome adjustment from the uh, anticipated shortfall that we were looking at. So um, I think it's, it's definitely great news. And uh, with that said, all in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, uh, motion passes. Uh, Brian, item 4.2. Thank you, sir. So item 4.2, very brief from me. These are the exact same numbers that you saw um, a couple of weeks back at our previous Board of Education meeting this month. Nothing has changed here. We have not heard a final number, nor do we anticipate a final number being released anytime soon. Again, rumors came out not even five minutes ago via email about certain figures that were thrown around, but those are nothing but rumors. And you know that the legislative process is unique and will take some time for them to be able to complete and to flush out. So this represents our best guess based on what we have heard from our organizations. And this also takes into account um, some of the categoricals that I had talked about reducing at the last budget meeting as well. So these numbers have not changed. We're gonna ask you to adopt this budget this evening. Again, with our promise to you that we will come back to you in the fall when we know what our foundation allowance is and when we know what our student count is and when we know what our categorical aids are as well, as well as any type of probation that would have occurred over the summer. And we'll make sure that we get our budget um, much more dialed in and in tune with what this releases when they release it. So we'll ask for your approval of the 2021 budget tonight. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Do you wanna move first, Scott? Yeah, I can, I can, that's fine. I just, I saw Brian put up the slide. Um, all right, I will take a motion for item 4.2, please. I move to approve please. item 4.2, the approval of the general operating budget for 2020-2021. Support. support. That was support uh, by, I think, John. I'm sorry, I'm getting a slow feed, so I apologize, guys. It was Lynn. I think it was Lynn. Oh, okay. Lynn got yeah. Motion by Pam, supported by Lynn. Um, any discussion? Hey, Brian, that... Go ahead, uh, Bill. It, the anticipated unassigned was net of the budget variance, correct? So it was current minus eight, not current minus 9.4? Correct, yes, sir. And okay. we went back to a 1.5%. That's where we've historically been for the past couple of years. This final yeah. amendment this year, we moved to a 2% because with the COVID shutdown, we're getting more increased revenues from areas that we hadn't anticipated before. So this went okay. back to 1.5. Thanks. Yes, sir. I guess my only comment is uh, for all the years I've been on the school board, I've never seen so many uh, variables at play uh, in the budget. So thanks for putting this together uh, with so many unknowns. And I think we're all very eager to see uh, what they do in Lansing that'll really uh, impact uh, this budget moving forward. Yeah. We'll watch it close and make sure you're updated along the way. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, and, and in the eight years that, that I've served on the board, nearly eight years, um, I, I could never have imagined adopting a budget like this. Um, but at the same time, I could have never imagined adopting a budget like this and being able to take this punch and not affect the classroom. So, you know, that's an important message we've got to get out is, is you know, we set it up for this and we're ready for this. So, uh, Brian, again, thank you for all the work that you've done putting this together for us. Okay, that said, all in favor of supporting uh, motion for item 4.2, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, item 4.2 passes. That moves us to uh, item five on our agenda, request to address the board. Um, Mike, is there anybody there that would like to address the board? You, you have um, <clears throat> the one on the agenda, Jonathan Haynes, will be the first one, and then we'll go from there um, as people sign up. Right now I have no sign ups, but we'll, I'm sure we may have some. Okay. Um, I'm actually name? I'm actually going to be uh, introducing our group uh, just at first and then Jonathan will finish up with our, our statements in the end if that's all right. Um, who is this? 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Okay. So yeah, first, um, I would like to just thank uh, Board President McFarland for the introduction, and I would also like to thank the board for allowing us to present today. Um, our team is Anti-Racist Midland, or ARM, um, and we are a team comprised of Midland Public Schools graduate graduates advocating for anti-racist education and reform in the Midland area. On June 6th, uh, we launched a petition with demands for reform within Midland Public Schools. By the time you received the petition and our 10 demands on June 15th, um, the petition amassed over 2,000 signatures. Um, our demands include a district-wide statement declaring race as an issue within MPS, um, an improved curriculum focusing on black history, racism, and white privilege, mandatory diversity training for staff from an independent organization, leadership and anti-racism, um, providing a periodic public update regarding progress towards outlined goals, a district-wide ban of the Confederate flag, public commitment to hiring more teachers and administrators of color and additionally supporting current faculty members of color, creating a centralized public local reporting system to track racial or otherwise prejudicial incidents of discrimination or harassment, develop workshops and provide resources for at-home education of parents and students, and finally, the allocation of funds for additional mental health counselors and mental health um, resources in the district. And now Superintendent Sharo and the, the school board, you all uh, have on many occasions heavily relied on the DEI plan as a response to our team's demands. That is the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, advisor group uh, that works on these issues in the last year. And on June 9th, uh, Superintendent Sharo and the board, you preemptively addressed our three original demands in a special district communique saying, in the public schools, uh, quote, quote, in the public schools hears you and agrees with your request, unquote. Furthermore, Superintendent Sharo and the board claim that, quote, MPS currently has work in progress that aligns with the request of the petition, unquote, citing their DEI strategies and initiatives, which included a, a curriculum audit, skill set training, and continued collaboration with experts and DEI advisory group. Following the petition, on June 16th, our team met with Superintendent Sharo. Uh, Associate uh, Superintendent Penny Miller Nelson and the DI consultant, uh, Dr. Amy Beasley, uh, discussed our full list of demands after it was, uh, after it was distributed to the, the school board. In response to the meeting, Superintendent Charles spoke with the Midland Daily News saying, again, quote, it's what uh, we are attempting to do with the DI plan. It lines up very well with the DI plan uh, that's been established and not yet fully implemented, unquote. In that same statement, uh, Mr. Charles has even suggested that our team, quote, was not aware of Midland Public Schools' DEI plan, unquote, uh, a plan that is ostensibly publicly available and referred to in the June 9th superintendent communique. Uh, it has come clear to us uh, and the, the community that a diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory group is also unaware of any such DEI plan. They recently authored a statement in which it was emailed to you and local media sources just prior to this board meeting. Uh, and although uh, Mr. Sharo uh, denied the, them the opportunity to speak officially uh, tonight, uh, they're speaking in the public comments section later. Uh, but a statement not only stands behind all of our 10 demands, but also characterizes the administration, the board's official response to their demands as, quote, misleading and overstated. Thus, before we expand on our demands in a public comment section, we want to take uh, a moment to call uh, and bring attention to you all the lack of transparency and ownership uh, of the issue at hand, not only with the public, but with our own, with your own internal stakeholders, the DEI advisory group. So how can we trust the public uh, community stakeholders trust the board and the administration to confront and really root out the racist rot when there's you, you've all already shown to willingly mislead the community. Uh, the magnitude of the issue of racism within this district cannot be explained away in a statement or pushed off under the veil of work being done in an advisory group that had a different understanding of the plan they were tasked to develop. What we need now, especially more than ever, is honesty and transparency. We must be open about the work that has to be done and the extensive work ahead. It's the only way we can work to create a better learning environment for our community. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Mr. Chair, is there anybody else who would like to address the board? Um, Becky sent you the list. Yeah, I've gotten that. Um, Becky, King. Becky King, Mr. McFarland. Oh, 
Okay, Becky, are you yes. are you with us? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay. Hi, um, Becky. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. My name is Becky Thomas King. I reside at 405 Lingo Lane, and I'm the parent of two Plymouth Elementary students, but I'm speaking tonight as a Midland High teacher. Um, in addressing the current call for more diverse voices within the MPS curriculum, I want to share two things tonight. What we've done in English language arts and what we need going forward. So what we've done. The last time I spoke here was two years ago regarding the absolute true diary of a part-time Indian. At that time, we felt as English teachers that bringing an honest voice of color into the curriculum was a fight and, and that's sad. Um, I hope that the current societal pressure will prevent us feeling that way in the future. But the good news, the good news is um, we have two pieces that are in the book rooms ready to go out to our ninth graders this fall. And one is entitled Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. And um, that is an African-American voice, a teenager. And Piecing Me Together is from a female teenager point of view um, of a young black woman. But I also want to share, I think the public needs to know um, the lengthy process we go through to adopt these books. So far as I understand, it's typically a 12 to 18 month approval process from examination to classroom instruction. And that's only if there's money to purchase the tests. So the first thing that, just to touch base so everybody knows what happens in this process, we have to fill out paperwork and we have forms just to get permission to examine the texts. After that, we get the examination copies, they go out to the teachers, and each teacher who reads these books has to fill out a separate form for each book. The more names on the committee, the higher the chances are it'll be approved. Um, and these forms also have to address any objectionable content. Once every teacher has filled out all the individual forms, the forms are compiled into a master document and that's several pages long. The forms then go to the curriculum office, then the board of education. There's a 28 day examination period where the texts sit in the um, administration building for any community members to read and provide feedback on its potential adoption. Then the book goes to the board for adoption. It's decided whether it's full class text or just a choice book. And then again, if there's money, the texts are purchased, they're delivered to the schools, stamped, tagged for student checkout. The process is arduous, but as English teachers, we continue to jump through these hoops because we think it is really important to our students' experiences. In the words of a poet, Cesar Cruz, we feel obligated to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable, as well as producing career and college ready students. College has the tendency to disturb the comfortable. So this brings me to point number two, what we need moving forward. The Board of Education and the public should know that we teachers do face criticism when bringing in more diverse voices. For example, um, last fall, some English teachers brought in the PBS series, What I Hear When You Say. And this pushed some students out of their comfort zones, listening to people of color talk about how language is used toward them. Last fall, we had parents and students actually complain about the content and the lack of white voices within the series. Some of my colleagues still haven't taught part-time Indian in class. They worry that they won't have the administrative support with resources such as these, so they avoid them. It's just easier to keep teaching the old man in the sea sometimes. And that's a detriment to our students and to the district. We need to know that when an angry parent comes our way, that the administration won't back down, that they won't silence the much needed conversations regarding racism, privilege, and power in our society, even if they make people uncomfortable. If we don't get, have legit support after all of this, what is it all for? We're the ones vetting the texts, putting ourselves out there and trying to support all of our students' social and emotional needs, especially our most vulnerable students. We want to adhere to the request of over 2,000 people who signed the petition. 
We want this to be more than just a passing cultural moment. And my fellow English teachers and I have been working hard over the past few years to do just that. Thank you. Becky, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments and appreciate you spending time with us tonight. Um, Mr. Sherrill, is there anybody else who would like to address the board this evening? Your second or your third speaker is Kelly Murphy. Uh, okay, G Kelly, I'm sorry. Yes, hello. Hi, Kelly, I'm sorry. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank the you. floor is yours. Hi, my name is Kelly Murphy and my address is 4514 Wild Pine Court South. I'm an English teacher and the IB coordinator at Midland High. I'm here today to share some thoughts on supporting anti-racist initiatives. First, teachers need training in how to talk about race and racism in the classroom. Second, we need to continue to adopt more diverse texts into the curriculum. And third, we need to address the needs of our stakeholders who are agitating for change. Authentic training on these issues is crucial. This past fall, Associate Superintendent Penny Miller Nelson invited me to participate in the African American Student Initiative Training through the Michigan Department of Education. The topic of the initiative was race, power, and privilege, dismantling through dialogue. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Educators in various capacities from around the state met monthly and were led through conversations about race, racism, white privilege, education, and cultural diversity by experts in the field, Dr. Jill Griffin and Dr. Clyde Barnett. It was challenging work to learn and unlearn, to be reflective and critical, and to grow. We needed the guidance and leadership of Dr. Jill and Dr. B to navigate these conversations. I was one of only two MPS teachers invited to this. All teachers need this kind of focused exposure to issues of race, power, and privilege. Just as the work through the African American Student Initiative was challenging, teaching texts about race and racism is challenging for both teachers and students. It can be uncomfortable, but that does not mean this teaching should not happen. Rather, teachers need first to be given tools to discuss race and racism in the classroom, and second, to be supported by building and district administration when we teach texts dealing with race and racism. Second, we must continue to add more diverse texts into our curriculum. As Becky King explained, the English departments at both Midland High and Dow High have been working for years to diversify the texts we are able to offer to our students. This process is long and we have made some progress by adding some great new texts by black authors and we'll continue to try to add more because we know how important and we know the importance and value of including diverse voices, especially black voices in light of the Black Lives Matter movement. But we've also seen this process fail as it did with the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian three years ago one of our only texts from BIPOC voice, from a BIPOC voice. After following the process appropriately, getting the book approved and adopted, we had to fight to be allowed to teach it. Even then, after following the new guidelines for teaching it, which required teachers to send permission slips home, a small group of community members launched a campaign against the book. We felt defeated and exhausted. Sadly, many teachers now elect not to use this novel because they're unable to do so in a whole class setting and are therefore unable to help students navigate the discussions of race, identity, and culture. Teachers also choose not to teach it because they fear backlash from parents and lack of support from the district, despite significant support from the community, if you'll recall the packed boardroom in 2018. Because of this, we're doing our students a disservice by not giving them the opportunity to read this text. This can be rectified by providing consistent structural support to teachers. The fact is, including diverse texts in the classroom benefits all students. BIPOC students deserve to see themselves reflected in the text studied, and white students must learn about the experience of people different than themselves, written by BIPOC authors, as opposed to white authors. To paraphrase Dr. Rudeen Sims Bishop, books can be windows into different worlds and can also be mirrors that reflect back to us so we can see our own lives and experiences as part of the larger human experience. We must do our part to provide texts that are both windows and mirrors for our students. Lastly, our community, our students and community are calling for change as evidenced by the over 2000 signatures of MPS students, parents and alumni on the letter to MPS. Additionally, several English teachers have received emails from students requesting text by black authors. They recognize the absence of black voices in our curriculum and they recognize the power of literature in stories as a way to combat racism. Here are a few of their thoughts and requests. One student wrote, for me personally, reading biographies and stories written by African Americans has challenged what I thought and made me more outspoken about this issue. I hope that more focus on African American stories and history will help burn through the ignorance that it's so many in our white dominated community face and provoke action and bravery to speak up. 
Another student wrote, in light of recent events, other students and I have become aware of how little African-American representation there is in our assigned English class literature. I want to express my interest in including more works by African-American authors in our studies. In a, such a wonderfully diverse world, I think it's important that we take in a variety of perspectives and are taught to value the work of minority writers. And finally, Another student wrote, reading and learning about what it's like to be a minority is an important way that white people can learn to use their privilege to fix the system. One student alone may not be able to change everything, but with the help of one story, there might just be a chance. Receiving emails like this from students is bittersweet. On one hand, I'm proud and amazed by my students' thoughtfulness and open minds. On the other hand, I feel powerless to give them what they're asking because of the hoops we have to jump through to get books adopted. Stories are powerful and stories come in many forms, not just novels. They must go through the adoption process. Teachers are able to choose text in various formats to use in our classrooms as well. However, we must feel supported by our building and district administration when we incorporate texts that deal with race, racism, and anti-racism, because these are real issues in our country, state, city, and schools. We must be given the tools to discuss these topics in our classroom. The petition demands many good things, and I'm encouraged by this. There are also some good things happening in our district right now, but MPS must provide authentic, required training and give teachers unwavering support for us to truly make a difference. Thank you for your time. Kelly, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments and, and I'm glad you joined us tonight to share uh, the views of your students um, who I think are, are very forward thinking and, and it's remarkable that they're sending you those letters. Um, so stay with us and uh, we're gonna see if there are any other guests uh, waiting to speak tonight. Mike, is there anybody else that would like to address the board? You have quite a few. The next is Dr. Jennifer Vanette. Okay, thank you. Dr. Vanette. Thank you. This statement is on behalf of the MPS DEI advisory group. Midland Public Schools in the wider community has for too long allowed harm to marginalized students to go unaddressed. Harm has been perpetrated in explicit ways such as racist slurs and videos by fellow students, threats of violence against student leaders, and outright denial of a student's identity on the part of MPS staff. And harm has been perpetrated in unconscious ways such as not being represented in curriculum or scheduling important exams during non-Christian holidays. Those who have cried out have been placated or silenced and little change has occurred. The district has yet to make a bold statement declaring that racism is a problem in our district. We must act swiftly and with intention. Our students cannot wait. We need leadership that will not waver from commitment to become a safe and inclusive environment that values and respects those who have been marginalized. The MPS Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, or DEI, advisory group supports the efforts of the alumni-led group ARM and the demands expressed in their petition. We have concerns because the superintendent communique upheld our DEI advisory group as evidence of proactive work on the part of MPS to address and dismantle systemic racism, but we feel claims of action were misleading and overstated. We are volunteers with experience and expertise in many aspects of diversity and inclusion work but we're frustrated with the slow movement on our proposals and the inability to implement policies and practices. We have not sensed from the district a deep commitment to change and to change now. Many of the demands made by ARM echo appeals the DEI group made as far back as last November. We support the demands broadly, but we'd like to draw attention to a few demands in particular. We cannot truly value all people if we do not commit to more representational curriculum. In addition to endorsing ARM's demand for an improved curriculum focusing on black history, racism, and white privilege, the DEI advisory group insists that more non authors are represented in ELA classes and that learning about diverse people becomes standard practice in all classes. We expect this to be an ongoing process, but one that must begin immediately. And to that end, the Community Conversation Subcommittee also proposed an all district middle and high school read of stamps by Jason Reynolds for the upcoming academic year. It's imperative that we normalize conversations about race, racism, and privilege. We must cultivate a more diverse staff through hiring practices and recruiting efforts. We can change the curriculum, but if the staff does not value or understand the implications and content, then the curriculum will not have the impact that it could. Therefore, all district policies and hiring practices need to be examined for bias and racist practices. Mandatory diversity training for staff from an independent organization is essential. All district and building leadership need diversity training because they cannot lead until they are self-aware and competent. All teachers, staff must undertake mandatory and ongoing training. 
While we note several cohorts have taken part in various training efforts, we cannot be satisfied with small efforts. In addition to that training and in conjunction with the demand that MPS provides public updates regarding progress towards outlined goals, the community should receive detailed reporting about what topics were covered in each training session, who provided the training, and what continuing education is expected following the training. Banning the Confederate flag on district property should be emphatically supported. There is precedent since schools have always been able to place reasonable limitations on speech and often do so through dress codes. We implore you to act swiftly firm in the knowledge the flag represented commitment to slavery and white supremacy and only resurged in response to the civil rights movement and especially Brown v. Board. The flag is a symbol of hate that causes distraction and creates an unsafe environment. Current events have turned our attention to race, racism, and privilege, but we must remember to examine how prejudice and discrimination affect all marginalized people with mindful intention to expand our curriculum training and hiring practices to be more fully representational. Our diversity is inherent. Now we need to cultivate inclusion. As an educational institution, we have a special responsibility to facilitate growth around hard topics and to help our community unlearn our biases. It is time to push into productive discomfort where learning occurs. We cannot claim to educate all students equally while we dismiss conversations that represent the full pain, the full experiences, and the full contributions of Black people and all marginalized people. Sincerely, the members of the DEI Advisory Group. Thank you. Dr. Burnett and the DEI Advisory Group, thank you very much for for joining us tonight. We always appreciate your comments and insight, um, and I appreciate your time and, and speaking tonight. Um, so stick with us. And Mike, uh, it sounds like we've got a, a long list of, of speakers tonight, so we're going to move on. Uh, Mike, who is who is next, please? Rachel Spears. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rachel? Hi. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, a little nervous, I don't usually speak out, so. Um, my children are biracial. Um, both of my children have attended Midland Public Schools. My son recently graduated. Um, my daughter is still attending, she's at Northeast. Um, and both of my children have experienced overt and covert racism at school and within the Midland community. Um, one incident that I wanted to highlight was um, something that happened to my son in middle school. There was a student who didn't particularly like him um, and he was a part of the same friend group that my son was in. And um, they had kind of been around each other at various times. And um, this person <clears throat> got angry at my son and told him that he should take his people and to go back where he came from. <laughs> to take his people and go back where he came from. <laughs> so I, um, scheduled a meeting with the assistant principal and they told me that they were aware of the issue, but it, that it had nothing to do with race. That actually that student was referring to my son and his Pokemon playing friends. And that of course it couldn't have anything to do with race because they just had a diversity assembly. And so they had learned all about that and this child couldn't be referring to his race. So I say to you that that moment right there showed to my family that we weren't going to be believed, that we were not important, we were not taken seriously, what you're doing in diversity training for your students and obviously your administration is not really working. And we learned right there that there was no point in bringing it up again because we were not gonna be listened to and not believed. So 
I echo that there needs to be a statement made. That there is a problem with racism within the school district. It needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be addressed because my daughter is still there. And while there are many great things with the Midland Public School District, she should not have to continue to go through this. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Rachel. Um, I just wanna tell you that if you're still with us, um, you know, you are important and we do believe you. You and your family are very important to us in our community. So uh, thank you for tonight, tonight for, for sharing that. Um, Mike, next up, it looks like Lauren Phil. Am I on mute? You're good to go. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lauren, are you with us? Lauren Phil. <laughs> Hi, here. Lauren. Hi. Thanks for joining um, us. Thank you for having me. Um, hi, my name is Lauren and I'm an incoming senior at Dow High and I really appreciate you all giving me the time to share my opinions as a student uh, concerning the possibility of online school next year. Uh, I've done online school myself this past semester and on a few other occasions and I'm here to say it's not nearly as effective as in-classroom learning. Uh, we lose essentially all hands-on experiences, we have no group conversations, and students do not speak up while on online platforms. Uh, students are also held much less accountable because it's easy to disengage on online platforms. Uh, it's easy to turn off your phone and, or turn on your phone and goof around while on a Zoom call. And all assessments and assignments that are given online are open book by default. So again, student accountability for actually understanding the material is diluted. I'd also like to say as a young person, I'm constantly being told by other older generations that I spend way too much time on screen. And they're absolutely right. Substituting real relationships with online ones should not be acceptable, and having school online does just this. Before you turn school online or partially online, you must prove that you're not hurting our mental health or our chances of being successful. You need to know that what this will do to the rate of suicide and substance abuse in students. I have friends who have become depressed due to school shutdown during this time, and in my experience, mental health problems are a bigger risk for young people compared to corona. Everybody is saying that these are extraordinary times that require extraordinary measures, and I expect my senior year to be extraordinary. In order for it to be extraordinary, it needs to be Monday through Friday, face-to-face -face in school. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I, I can tell you, as a father of four, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, you, as you also know, we are bound by the state requirements and CDC guidelines in terms of whether we ha are able to uh, conduct school face to face. So this is this was not a decision that um, we made voluntarily. It was something that we just had to do to comply with state rules and regulations. Um, but as I'm sure you've already heard, that we are we are vigorously uh, exploring ways to get back into the classroom. It's it's what needs to be done. So um, I agree completely with all of your statements, and, and thank you so much for for joining us tonight and commenting. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike. Who who's next, please? Kofi Alfaro Darko, and Kofi, excuse me if I pronounced your last name wrong. No worries. Kofi. Um, is it possible to have another community member go before me uh, in the speaking order? Yeah, I, let's I, move I, on to Mr. McFarland, Josiah Greiner. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Josiah. We had an order that we wanted to speak in with the anti-racist Midland, and I was not the first person either that was supposed to go. If that's too much of a hassle, we can, can get, continue with the order, but if we could, it would be best if we could be in order. Okay, I, I just don't want to have everything so jumbled that we don't know who's coming up or, or in what order. Um, or it looks like maybe Cameron McGee is up next to speak. Um, if Cameron is ready to comment, uh, I think that would be okay. And then we'll go back to, to Mr. Afari Darko and then circle back to you. But if Mr. McGee is not ready, then I would ask that you just comment and we'll take it from there. We can, we can do that. Okay, so Mr. Uh, Cameron McGee, is Cameron McGee available to comment? Yes, I am. 
Hi, Cameron. Thanks for joining us and, and being ready. We appreciate it. Thank you. So I am a graduate of Dow High. I'm a part of the anti-racist Midley group. And we wanted to talk a little bit more in depth about the different demands that we have um, as they were stated at the beginning. So the one that I will be covering is the banning of the Confederate flag on all campuses. Um, we think that this is just something that really needs to be done. In my personal experiences, it has become such a distraction for me when I'm learning. Um, it makes me uncomfortable to be in a school, in a hallway, in a classroom with other kids who are wearing it. Um, and, you know, different organizations such as, you know, NASCAR and the Navy, they have all banned this. We understand that some people may not like the fact that this is being banned, but we believe it's something that definitely needs to be done. Um, a lot of things say it has to be an educational disruption, but for kids like me, it is one. It puts you into a weird state of mind and a panic almost when you walk into a classroom and you see another kid wearing the Confederate flag. In one instance, when I was at MPS, I reached out and I said to my teacher in private, um, I would like to leave. I'd like to finish my work in the library. I'm not comfortable being in the classroom with this individual who's wearing this. The particular shirt um, was just offensive all the way around and it also had the flag on it. And it was the last time I ever reached out to a teacher about a race issue because my teacher looked at me and told me, well, maybe you need to learn to be more tolerant of other people. And that was when I truly lost faith in our school system supporting me and supporting people like me. Since that day, I have still had many experiences with racism. I was never able to talk to any teacher or administrator about them out of fear that everything would be repeated all over again. That all started when I saw someone wearing the Confederate flag and I was not helped in the way that I really needed to be. Um, we realize it's not something everyone will love, but it's not an infringement on the First Amendment, especially because it truly is an educational disruption to people like me. So we believe that this specific demand definitely needs to happen and not to be something that's just swept aside like so many other things in this category have been before. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron, for sharing your, your thoughts and your opinions and experiences. Um, we, we certainly appreciate your time tonight. Um, we're going to, I think, circle back now to Mr. Afari Darko if he is available. And from there, we're gonna to go to Mr. Greiner, if that's okay with everybody. Okay, Josiah is shaking his head, yes. Are you ready, yes. sir? Yes, Mr. McFarland, uh, thank nice you. Nice to see you again, by the way. Uh, nice to see you as well. <laughs> Miss you on the street. Yes. Uh, um, uh, President, Board President McFarland and, and the rest of the Board of Education, thank you again for, for letting me speak tonight. Um, I want to speak on, on two, um, the fact that MPS needs to improve their curricula uh, specifically re in relation to uh, Black history, racism, and white privilege. Um, and to that point, uh, MPS needs to conduct an, an independent uh, curriculum of the audit, the, or independent audit of the current curriculum that's in place. Um, and potential curriculums that may be adopted in the future. Um, as a MPS student, uh, the first time I came in, into uh, experience with a, somewhat of a re revisionist history was um, only in, in the 11th grade um, when I took IB Histories of America. Um, and you know, that is a very select number of students in the district have that opportunity to uh, engage with with texts from historians like Howard Zinn, who write incredible uh, people's history of, of America, uh, highlighting both the uh, 
high points and the low points of our, our nation's history, um, which is, is something that we need to all, um, as MPS students, learn, learn about. Um, we need to learn about the struggles of minorities in this country um, and, and racism and white privilege and how that, that uh, works out in systems that we have in place today. Um, we understand that this is already happening, um, but I think it's it's important uh, to be transparent and communicate with the, the community, um, given the, the timing um, of everything. Um, and um, the community just needs to be informed on how this, this audit is going and the results of the audit, uh, the audits that occur in the future. Um, so that, that's my first point there. We really need to have independent audits and, and the community needs to be continuously informed on how those audits are going the results of the audit and how we're moving forward as a school district. My second point is on mandatory uh, diversity training for staff, um, preferably from an independent organization. Uh, DI committee has put together some phenomenal um, uh, diversity trainings for this upcoming school year from what I've heard. Um, and some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional, but diversity and inclusion is not something that should be optional. Um, every single employee in the, middle, in, in the Midland public school system needs to take this to heart. Um, and so this needs to be something that an independent organization that specializes in diversity training uh, needs to be able to come in and have can, on a, a regular basis uh, to have uh, these mandatory diversity trainings with all the staff. Um, I think uh, Midland Public Schools, you were very quick to, to show uh, the, the DEI events that were hosted, um, as we saw in, in uh, prior communiques um, about race in, in our school district, but many of those events were voluntary. Um, and it takes the entire community to come together to learn about uh, racism and, and white privilege um, and systemic oppression. And all of our employees in the, across Midland Public Schools need to learn, learn about this. Uh, this is not something that can happen with a select, you know, call it 50, 100 uh, employees in the school district. It needs to be across every single employee um, at every single training. This, there's no way that you can have diversity training be optional. Um, no way. You only make progress in this community. Uh, you only make Midland Public Schools. Let's take Midland Public Schools to be that top 1% of public schools in the nation, uh, school districts in the nation. That, how you do that, you have staff who are knowledgeable about diversity um, and understand that every student's coming from a different background and we appreciate those backgrounds and we learn to be a more progressive community uh, together. Uh, thank you board for your continued work and uh, you know, as an alum of Midland Public Schools, I will continue to hold you guys to a very high standard um, and will be patiently waiting to, to hear progress that we, we make when it comes to um, diversity and inclusion in the in Midland Public Schools. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. And, and I'm glad you're out there holding us to a high standard. Uh, you had a lot of great points um, and a lot of uh, great suggestions for us to think about moving forward. Uh, so we certainly appreciate your input. And, uh, and it was great to see you tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Please tell your parents I said hello and um, stick with us. We've got a lot, a lot more to come. Um, Mike, who's next? Well, you're, you're losing me just a little bit where you've jumped all over. I oh, believe... we're, go we're going back to uh, Mr. Greiner. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to leave you hanging there. Mr. Greiner, you have the floor. All right, thank you so much for your time. Uh, just wanting to continue to dive into uh, the list of the demands we stated at the beginning and just flush them out a little bit more. Uh, first off, we want to talk about that this is not just a change that we want to hold to Midland Public Schools. This is something that we want to be, uh, Midland Public Schools to be pioneer examples of to encourage other school systems to be able to follow suit. This is not a change that we only want to, for Midland Public Schools. This is the way we want to see all public schools, all schooling, be able to, to run like this. So how much better would it be for Midland to be able to push forward and create a system that if you look around the country, around the nation, there's not many school districts that are doing it well. <laughs> and that's really sad to hear, but it'd be great for Midland Public Schools, especially a predominantly white school district, to be able to step forward and be able to say that we care about the, the marginalized, we care about the people that aren't being heard, and we wanna be able to lift their voices up. And if we can do that, and not only do that with our schools, be able to share our information with other schools in the Great Lakes Bay area, and to be able to continue to lift up 
and even other listen to other school districts that have uh, different demographics than us and be able to hear what they have to say. I think there's a lot that we can learn from them. Uh, I know that we have some connections with some other school districts and there are open dialogue, but just being continuing as a lot of these DEI statements move forward and get rolling. And as we, we hope that they continue to do, we want you to be able to share this information with others as you go through problems that things that go well, things that don't go well, be able to share that information with other schools that follow suit so that they can be able to maybe do it a little bit better or a little bit differently to try something else. That's extremely important for us at the, at ARM. And next, I wanted to be able to talk about was transparency and accountability, providing public statements uh, such as the communicate every marking period regarding progress towards outlined goals. Uh, like Kofi said, uh, this is not something that we want to just like put out into the void and just hope that it happens. This is something that we want to hold accountable for, not just through meetings like this, but something that's easily accessible, something that any person can be able to find. Although there has been an, an outpour of support and there's lots of people here that are coming in that care about the community, this is not always the most accessible way for someone to be able to find information. So having something that's public and progressive that shows um, ways that are moving forward as you implement these plannings, as you implement mand mandatory uh, DEI trainings, as you move forward and abandon the Kidfire flight, we want to know how these things are going. We want to know when there's back steps. We want to know when there's forward steps and not just be able to just sit and wait and do nothing. And other ways we can do this are even at the high school news organization levels, uh, both Midland and Dow High have great uh, high school newspapers and how great would it be for students to be able to have easy ways to be able to know how, how their Midland Public Schools board is being able to take care of them. And also continue to go through communiques, going through parents' newsletters, being able to be able to email. We don't know exactly what it will look like, but it needs to be accessible, it needs to be transparent, and we want to be able to know how our school board is going and how you guys are pushing forward with these things. And we don't want to just have to wait a few months for this to just happen. And then maybe it goes away. Maybe it doesn't because we know it's a long process. There's a lot of things that have to go through, but we want to be able to be there while you guys go through that process. Thank you for your time. And uh, we hope to see further dialogue about this. Thank you, Mr. Griner. We appreciate the comments and uh, transparency and accountability has, I think, always been at the top of our list, um, as well as being a pioneer um, district uh, on many levels. And, and I think this should be one of them as well. So um, we do appreciate your comments. I appreciate your comments and your time tonight. Um, it, it's hard. I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm brushing you guys off because we have so many people that are waiting in line to speak. Um, so stick with us. And uh, we, we do have a number of speakers, as you know, that are that are waiting. So um, we're going to keep moving by, you know, thank you. Thank you tonight. We appreciate it. Um, Mike, who is next? I believe we're up to Jarrett Holman. Holman. Okay. Mr. Holman. Is Jarrett Holman available? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm here. How are you, sir? Thank you. I'm fantastic. So as uh, Mr. Shar said, my name is my name is Jared Holman. Uh, I graduated from Midland High in 2016. My mom has taught uh, at MPS for over 20 years, and I am a member of Anti-Racist Midland. We demand that MPS create a centralized public local reporting system to track racial or otherwise prejudicial incidents of discrimination or harassment. So we. Um, as a team are aware and recognize uh, the Active Allies initiative that was launched in March prior to the mandatory shift to distance learning. Currently, uh, it is our understanding that these incidents uh, are that are taken to Active Allies are recorded via the Illuminate portal and routinely reviewed by the administration. Similar to how instances of bullying are reported to the state, we wish for MPS to publicly release the categorical frequency of the aforementioned incidents as a way to measure progress across the district. Uh, for anonymity reasons, the details of these incidents should um, remain internal, but as far as frequency and um, categorical data, we would like those to be released publicly. In coherence uh, with our previous request that Josiah was just mentioning, um, we request that this data be uh, disseminated via the superintendent communique or any other desirable medium for the district 
Um, once again, Josiah had mentioned a number of different options of ways that this data could be released to the public, um, but we wish for this to be very accessible for anybody. And um, really just, once again, this sort of relates back to the accountability and um, how we just want to measure the progress and the implementation of these demands and see how that affects um, the relative count of, or the relative frequency of these incidents uh, and just be a good way to measure that. Um, and if the board members would hear me, I would like to close uh, my time by referencing a few comments made from both the board and uh, Superintendent Sharo regarding the issue of racism in Midland Public Schools. So during the uh, May 2020 Board of Education meeting in response to Dr. Amy Beasley's DEI presentation, um, Board Trustee uh, Lauterbach said that DEI needed to be ingrained in the culture of the district and that it has to come from the top down and it has to come from the board. Um, in a similar sentiment at the end of the March 2019 special edition communique that was in response to a disgusting racist video that circulated Midland High, Superintendent Shara said that we must now take action to stop racism, separation and exclusion actions um, and behaviors. So that was obviously well over a year ago. And I'm genuinely curious if the board believes they have done enough to facilitate this culture shift and build an anti-racist culture within Midland Public Schools. And all I ask is um, when listening to the remaining portion of our demands and listening to our demands in general, all I ask is that you do the right thing and do what's um, in the best interest of the community and what pushes us to a more anti-racist community. So thank you again. And uh, we appreciate you guys allowing us to speak tonight. Jared, thank you for your comments tonight. Um, we appreciate your time and, and our interests are always um, for the best interest of our students and our children and the community. So um, we are taking your comments and suggestions to heart. Um, with that said, uh, we do have to move on. Uh, Mike, can you tell us who the next speaker is, please? Uh, and excuse me for pronunciation if I do it wrong. Oh, and you, you obviously know them better than I do, it sounds like, Scott. Afua. Did I pronounce it right? Afua? Oh, yep, Afua. Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry. I even I even asked for help here, no, and I didn't get much help. I'm sorry about that. So. No, it's all right. Yeah, it's Afua for you, Darko. Okay. Hi, Mr. Fran. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? Good, thanks. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Perfect. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Afua for you, Darko, and I'm a 2016 alumna of Dow High School. Um, I'm here to continue to present um, the demands proposed from anti-Midland, uh, excuse me, anti-racist Midland. Um, the first of the two demands that I will highlight tonight include having MPS issue a public commitment to hiring more teachers and administrators of color and supporting current faculty members of color. While the district has made a point to publicly prioritize this in the past, it needs to be a consistent and transparent initiative that includes reevaluation of recruitment, HR, and hiring practices in the district. MPS needs to ensure a welcoming environment for applicants of color, as is both likely and probable that the lack of this gesture has historically refrained applicants of color from applying to positions within middle public schools. Endless studies have shown that teachers of color boost academic performance of students of color, including improved reading and math test scores, improved graduation rates, and incre increased aspirations to attend college, which are all areas MPS could improve on. I personally did not, have, did not have a single teacher of color throughout my time at MPS. I often felt neglected in my abilities to connect with any teachers or staff regarding racially charged incidents that I experienced. To achieve this demand, MPS needs to embed equity and inclusion into HR recruiting guidelines and make a targeted effort to support the teachers of color currently in the system. Finally, we want to emphasize collaborating with experts, external resources, and teachers who have been fighting for years, and there are many of them in Midland, to create more inclusive reading lists, and this is just one of the many ways that current teachers of color can be and should be supported in the future. The next demand I want to address is the need for parent workshops and resources for at-home anti-racist education. There is a dire need for education outside the classroom, especially in a community like Midland. Compounding new in-class curricula with outside materials in home is the most effective way to ensure that anti-racist reform in education continues outside of the classroom. In order to change, to have change happen at Midland, anti-racist efforts must be both administered at home and in school. Providing at-home resources for parents and the general MPS community is a good gesture that can aid MPS in establishing themselves as an anti-racist ally, even if the resources are not taken full advantage of. 
This comprehensive community approach is the only way both Midland, the Midland community and Midland Public Schools can revise its current racist stance towards an anti-racist future. Thank you for your time, and I'm excited to see MPS become a pioneering leader in dismantling system systemic racism in the educational system by implementing the demands we have set forth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Safari Darko. We really appreciate you joining us tonight, and it was a pleasure to see you again. Um, you. We, your, your comments were, were wonderful, and uh, a, a lot of good insight and, and suggestions that um, you know I think we need to explore, and uh, along with everybody else since comment tonight it has it has been great. Um, so we are going to move on. Um, please stay with us. Uh, Mike, it looks like Connor Reed is next. Is that correct? I would agree. Okay. Mr. Reed, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, you, am I, is my microphone okay? My uh, Wi-Fi has been a little sketchy. You're tonight. Um, com coming through great. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Um, I graduated from Dow High in 2015 and then from Yale University in 2019. Um, I'm a member of Anti-Racist Midland, and tonight I would just like to expound upon our demand for professional mental health counselors within our schools as part of MPS's approach to becoming systemically anti-racist. Having men professional mental health services directly accessible within each school would be a major benefit to all MPS students. But these services and their widespread ease of access are an essential component of a truly anti-racist school system. According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, here are but a few statistics that illustrate the connection between racism and mental health. For one, black Americans are 20% more likely to report psychological distress as opposed to white Americans. Racial and ethnic minorities endure a disproportionately higher burden of disability due to mental health struggles. Depression is more likely to be persistent for Black and Latinx students. And importantly, racial and ethnic minority youth with behavioral issues are more likely to be referred to the juvenile criminal justice system than they are to services that could help them with underlying mental health issues. There must be a cultural and a fiscal commitment to providing all students access to mental health counselors. We understand that MPS currently engages in partnerships with outside mental health service providers in the city of Midland. And while we commend this, such an approach can only be satisfactory as an intermediate system towards in-house counselors. Teachers and school guidance counselors are already spread thin by their myriad responsibilities and the sheer volume of students that they interact with and represent. So to us, it seems very tenuous to assume that professionals who offer their services to the school in addition to the responsibilities of their other practices have the time and the resources to properly address the mental health needs of all our students. We additionally recognize the Active Allies program within the schools as a means by which the school may respond to student issues related to mental health or social emotional well-being. Uh, but like our other demands have made clear, the systems that we think are needed to deal with these issues properly must be proactive uh, and dedicated mental health counselors would form a very strong basis uh, of a proactive mental health system within MPS. And finally, we'd like to say that the school resource officers that are employed in service of our school district are unfortunately no replacement for dedicated in-house mental health professionals. Given that their addition to the district was funded through a new public millage, we believe the same mechanism can and should be pursued by the Board of Education to place and accommodate mental health professionals within our schools. Um, that is all I'd like to say tonight. So thank you all uh, for your time. I appreciate being able to speak with you. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Reed. We appreciate your comments and the statistics. Um, they are daunting statistics, unfortunately. Um, so it's, they're definitely noteworthy. Um, I, I appreciate you being here with us tonight. Stick with us if you wanna continue watching. Um, we are going to continue moving. Uh, there's a long list of folks behind you. Um, it looks like Mike, Erica Meyer might yeah. be next. Is that correct? That's what I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Erica Meyer. Are you available? Yes, thank you. Hi, Erica, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Um, my first comment would be on the demand of the Anti-Racist Midland Group for external training. Um, I am particularly concerned about this one as it has been communicated to me that Dr. Beasley, who is a, you know, a DEI expert would be implementing that training and, and facilitating those trainings. My concern comes in January when she is no longer around. What do we do then? We are not competent to provide these trainings ourselves, clearly. Um, 
the uh, my second comment is going to be about um, the communique. First, the special communique response to the petition. Um, the tone of that was not apologetic as I thought it should have been. Students were expressing that they've been harmed by our system. And although the district did say, we agree with you, there was not the necessary humility of saying, we are sorry we have harmed you and we have a lot to learn from you. The tone was, we got this, sit down, be quiet. And I know that some of the students felt that way. Intention or impact is more important than intention and our impact has been much, much worse than our intention several times. Um, so I, I mean, I think it, it's, it's clear to me at least that these kids are smarter than I am and they know more than I do and we need to listen to them. Um, and then my last, uh, well, almost my last point, um, today's communique came out and there was a page about um, some black voices from the LGBTQ plus community. And although that is, that is good to see, um, it's Pride Month. We acknowledge that it was Pride Month. I think, I think that's a bit of progress. It was hard with that juxtaposed next to a happy 4th of July for the citizens of the United States to celebrate. I have had many students whose parents are not citizens and a few who are not citizens themselves. That tone was anti-immigrant and anti-diversity. Non-citizens bring the diversity. Um, not to mention that 4th of July uh, from an anti-racist perspective is quite controversial. One of the reasons we wanted independence from the UK is so we could keep slavery. Also, the Native Americans probably do not celebrate any of their freedoms because we were given um, independence from from the from Britain, and so there's just a lot of of purposeful thought needs to go into the language that is used when we communicate with the public. Um, that step is missing. Um, my last two comments, really quickly, safe reporting. Um, I have reported one thing to HR um, in my seventh year. It was not related to racism; it was related to sexism, and I apologize for centering my own voice. However. I can imagine the fear these students have because I will never report anything ever again. It was not handled restoratively and it was handled in a way that made me not want to report to work, frankly. And I'm still waiting for the follow-up from that. Um, and finally, the Active Allies program as someone with a social work degree and knowing my colleagues who have degrees, master's degrees or whatever, it's an insult and it's inadequate. And we as teachers don't have the time nor are we qualified to do those things. Thank you. Thank you, Erica, for joining us tonight. Um, I, I do appreciate all of your comments and uh, they are being taken to heart by the board and the administration as well. Um, so just, just know that we do appreciate um, you know, what you're saying and, and we do have a lot to learn, quite frankly. Um, so I will tell you that if nobody else will, um, we acknowledge that. So. Thank you, and we are going to move on. Um, Mike, it, Andrea Vargas is is next up. Is that correct? Agree. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Can Andrea. Can you hear? Yeah. Hi. There you are. Um, Thank you. I have never been to one of these things before, but I felt that I needed, as a Latin American current student at Dow High, to just quickly put it in. I cannot. Um, give Ixa very direct instructions as the anti-racist Midland have done. They have done a very good job. But I truly ask that this is taken long-term very seriously. I have typically been afraid to speak up in certain circumstances because I'm kind of afraid of perpetrating the stereotype of this loud Latin girl. But that doesn't stop me from the fact that despite being a citizen, around the 2016, 2017, due to the current things, I was still asked how I crossed the border or I didn't, I heard a jump over the wall joke going to a fellow Latin American student who is much less white passing than me. And the fact that I was still too afraid to bring it up to somebody cause I, it was minor, right? It was just a simple comment. And 
the fact that I could still hear them passing through the hallways, but I couldn't tell who it was. And that I'm just so upset that we are in an environment where even this year, now that we're in 2020, I heard that same Latin student who was asked how they jumped over the wall, be asked how their pool service is going or told that they'd probably be a good service person by their friends and that the teacher in the area, maybe they didn't hear them or something, didn't say anything or the students around them didn't say anything. And what I'd really like to see in Midland Public School is to create a environment where that doesn't happen. And if it, people are too afraid for it to happen because that's the only way things can get better. I'd like to maybe call upon my orchestra teacher who's created the most, the environment that I feel the freest to be. If she hears a whisper of a possibly racist comment, she acknowledges it in front of everybody to ensure that it won't happen again. And I know that teachers can't always hear it, but I'd like to see them lay out the ground rules to create an environment that, that can't happen. Because how, how am I supposed to feel when I know that that could be whispered behind me? And then if I, I'm too afraid to bring it up because I don't wanna make a big deal out of it either. I just want to see an environment soon where this can't happen. I'm sorry, I don't have any specific instructions. I just would like to see change. That's all the instruction that, that we need. Um, Andrea, thank you for sharing that story with us in your experiences. Um, your voice was heard loud and clear tonight. So please keep speaking up. Please don't be afraid to be loud. Be heard, okay? Be heard, be strong, and, and we heard you tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Laura Gornicki. Laura, are you with us? Yes, Mr. McFarland, thank you, I am with you. Hi, Laura, thank you. Just thumbs up, hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thanks, I had trouble earlier. Um, I am on the district's diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory committee. Um, and I just wanna say I support Dr. Bennett's statement and also uh, the statements of the anti-racist Midland uh, members that have spoken. Um, I especially support the action items suggested, and I think they're necessary and pertinent. Um, but really, the reason I wanted to speak today is to share personal experiences with everybody. Um, it was after one of many racist incidents that made the media um, that came from Midland that I decided to walk around during parent-teacher conferences at Dow High School um, I had a son at Dow High, and I approached not just my son's teachers, but almost everybody in the cafeteria, which was pretty challenging, as everyone knows. <laughs> there, there are some long lines. And I asked teachers, most of whom were strangers, um, what they thought of um, the district's support of education related to diversity and inclusion, particularly in light of the racist video. I had an overwhelming response from staff members. They gushed and gushed and said they wanted to know more. They wanted to do better. Um, they wanted to be better and they were struggling to do so and they really felt that they did not have support. Um, many of them before they said anything asked who I was and why I was asking and if I was going to report anything to administration. Um, there seems to be a real fear of administration amongst MPS staff. Um, I was really flabbergasted by their response and I felt sad for them. I've been in, in, in and out of education for um, 23 years myself. I currently work for the Saginaw Intermediate School District and I feel we really have um, a solid plan for diversity, equity and inclusion. And we look at everything through that lens. I recommend Midland Public does the same. Um, uh, there were two teachers who said, no, we, we do everything fine. There's not racism in my classroom. Um, and one of them even told me, um, by the way, I identify as lesbian, not that that matters, but one of them even told me he wasn't, there wasn't a problem with um, uh, racism, but he wasn't a big fan of the gay agenda. This was a teacher. Um, I had trouble with that. The administration did swiftly respond to that, and I appreciated that. I had a call right away the next morning. Um, but many things administration has not responded to. I have a black son. 
my son, I've asked him always about racism and he won't engage. He won't talk to me for years and years until he was suspended last year for three days for videotaping a teacher using the N-word during instruction. Um, my son said he was cajoled into doing this um, because the classroom setting was racist. Um, he broke down crying. He'd never talked to me about these issues his whole life and immediately came this deluge of trouble that had happened since he was a small kid. Pencils through his hair, jokes about how his dad's not around because his dad's probably in prison. Um, uh, the N-word on a daily basis in class. I don't know that the teachers hear it or not, but it's happening. Hallways, classrooms, cafeteria. Um, uh, the N-word written in bathroom stalls. Um, my son once very bravely got up the guts, he could be a kind of shy kid, to tell his school administrators that he had heard the N-word three times in class, um, or excuse me, in the hallway before class, and an administrator told him, um, to not hang around with those people and to get away from them. So this isn't just the teachers that need training. This really truly has to be district wide. Um, my son heard monkey noises played on his peers' phones during the movie Selma. Um, he has, I, I, I can't begin to understand everything he's experienced at MPS, but I know because of the reaction I've gotten when I tried to do my part to possibly affect some change I feel that I've been swiftly rebuked and that like Erica Meyer said, the response seems to be, we've got this, be quiet, everything's under control, we're doing this, but we have this committee. Um, and I urge Midland Public to take the concerns of the students and all these community members seriously this time and, and instigate some swift and decisive action and do less talking. Um, there are a lot of good people on board who 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 are in support of this, and um, I, I do hope change happens. Uh, thanks for the time. Thank you, Laura. We appreciate you being here tonight. We appreciate all of your comments and, and you sharing that information with us. Um, I know that may not have been easy to do, but um, it certainly gives us a lot to think about and, and helps shed light on, on what's going on. So uh, thank you very much for that. I, I appreciate you and I appreciate your time. Um, next we have uh, Eric Krause. Eric, are you with us? Yes. Eric Krause. Hi, Eric. Can you guys see me? Here Cannot I am. See. There you are. All right. Hey. Thank you, sir. Uh, for those you don't know me, I'm Eric Krause. I'm starting my 25th year at MPS. But uh, for those of you thinking, boy, he looks older than that, I started in my late 30s. So that'll give you an idea of my age. My wife just retired uh, a year ago after starting 1985. That was back, Mr. Sharl, when the uh, superintendent had a cake job with no problems. So things have changed. Um, I want to thank the anti-racism group and the board. I've been in the majority as a white male from where I've lived or gone to school my entire 61 years of living. Um, the definition of ignorance includes the phrase lacking knowledge or awareness. Therefore, because of my being in the majority my entire life, I've been ignorant of racial injustice that's been interwoven into our land far before it was even a country. I'm not preaching, that would be hypocritical. Um, I'm as guilty as anyone of thinking wrongly in regards to race. So what do we do? This takes more than a my bad. This takes more than an apology. For me, my angle is we have to realize our ignorance, acknowledge our wrongs, educate ourselves and others to stop the ignorance of racial injustice. That's why I applaud any efforts by these the young people of the group and for the board for listening to try to put us on that path. It's not gonna be easy. And in the last month, I'm embarrassed to admit how much I've learned. That's nothing to be proud of. It's more embarrassing to just admit it's the way I've been, what I've been immersed in. So I applaud all the efforts, whether it's the white fragility group, uh, the DEI forums. And I would appreciate it as a staff member for more. If I can open my eyes a little bit more, anyone can. Maybe that should be the bracelet. If Krauss can do it, anyone can do it. 
Um, I'm okay with that. I just feel that we have to wake up. I have many friends who are coming at me with a lot of the, uh, the attitudes that I've been immersed in. And that's a whole nother story and a whole nother time where I'll be using people like a Jonathan Haynes to, to help me out. You know, it is, it is a little uh, humbling when some of these people you knew were smarter than you were and they were 10 years old. But regardless, that's where we're at. I'll end it, though, on a, on a warning for the board. I truly appreciate it. This is where you're going to earn your big bucks because I know you board members make thousands of dollars. Um, it's going to be tough. Because if you've been watching the news and you look at like the Palm County, uh, I can't remember the county in Florida talking about how masks were the works of the devil and so forth. If we go about this the right way, board members are gonna take some heat. I, I know just the things I've said tonight, I could take heat for it, which is embarrassing. You know, it's amazing, but it's there. So I just know that I'll be supporting you because you guys will be on the front line and uh, that is no reason to back down. Not at all. Hey, I think I made it under my five minutes. First time in my life. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. We appreciate that. And, and you know what? It's, it's okay if we take some heat. Uh, you know, acknowledging reality and acknowledging um, the gravity of the situation. If that brings, if that brings heat on us, um, you know, so be it. It, it, it should, um, and rightfully so. So that's something that um, I am ready for as the board president, and I think that uh, our board is ready for as well. So, man, we really appreciate you coming on tonight and um, offering some comments. And, and I love the, if Kraus can do it, we can do it because we're right there with you. The bracelet. Yes, sir. Okay, Eric, thank you so much. We're going to move on to uh, what I think is our last guest speaker tonight. Um, Amy Phoenix, are you still with us? Amy Phoenix. We'll give her a second. Hello, I'm here. Hi, Amy. Thanks for joining us. Okay, yes, thanks for having me. Um, I did not plan to speak this evening, but I just want to start by thanking everyone who has already spoken, um, thanking the board for being open to, to what you're hearing this evening. Um, I would really like to start with just sharing about listening and supporting families and staff and the community as a whole and, and what a big role the school has. I know that everybody here knows that already, which is why we're sitting in this room, even if it's many rooms <laughs> and a virtual room. Uh, and all of the information, uh, statistics, demands, um, suggestions, um, you know, marks at reality there with Krauss uh, are really pertinent. and. What comes to me with this is that this is this is way more than a mental game. This is really an issue of turning our hearts towards what is true and towards what is needed for our kids and for the families and for the community as a whole. Um, as a white mom of biracial and black children and a blended family, I also have white children. Um, I have shared, and I don't know if I've shared it here with the board before, because I've only spoken maybe once or twice, but I grew up in Midland. We left, went a couple different places. The last place we were here before being back in Midland in 2012 was in rural Missouri, which I can tell you was a lot different than here. And with my three older children who are biracial, I, I knew we had to get out of there because the mindset there was different. It was culture shock for me in terms of um, the things people would say and do in regards to race and other issues too, but specifically race. When we came back here, I thought it would be better. And every one of my kids has experienced stuff. One of them even left Midland Public Schools because of it, because, and, and I'll tell you, it was not only the kids saying things, it was how the staff responded, which you've already heard tonight. So, um, I'm not sure if this is in anybody's consciousness, but I keep feeling like I picked this up from different people. It's like, it's just not a real issue because for white people, we're not dealing with it. It's not personal. It's something you hear about. You can walk away from it. But we're not preparing and caring 
for these issues as human issues when we're walking away. People who are experiencing this every day can't walk away. And, and so we, we need to hold this in our hearts too and be able to listen and be able to really acknowledge the issues that, that these are. These are, not, these are not like other bullying comments. Like there's hatred and hurt and threats of death with this type of stuff. This is not little stuff. It's not like kindergarten when you're saying, you know, your nose is too big or something. It's, it's, it's different. <laughs> so um, in the turning of our hearts towards what is true, I'm really asking that we continue to listen and learn how to respond more towards what is actually needed. So in the moment, that's us listening to what someone is really saying and, and being able to empathize with them and believe them and not do the thing that has been done, which is dismiss it, um, avoid it, kind of minimize it. That's happened. Um, there's only been one staff member that I've spoken with in the now almost eight years about these issues. And mind you, most of my kids are like, don't say anything anymore because it's, it's gonna get the administration where they don't want to hear it. I've already heard it from this administration member that it's like, that's not, that's not really the issue. Or these kids are just gonna keep doing it, it's gonna get worse. So that mentality is, is alive and well here. And I'll tell you, I'm not feeding it at home. I'm, I'm not at home saying, um, you know, like I'm, I'm listening, but I'm also trying to stay open-minded to let's try and solve this with the school. And, and they're, they're not open to because they've been shut down. So how am I as a parent supposed to support my kids in the district with the teachers and with the um, staff when they try and bring it up and I try and bring it up and it doesn't actually change anything. I've only had one staff member who's actually heard me without defending themselves. So for all of us, like human beings are defensive. When things, when we, when we feel like we're attacked or, or it doesn't jive with who we think we are, we become defensive, defensive. And so what I want to end with is notice that and like take the time to work through that on these issues. We know who we are, but we also have to look at biases in ways that we're responding that are not helpful in these situations and move towards what's true in our hearts and what is helpful. Thank you for listening. Amy, thank you so much. Um, we do hear you. I hear you. And, uh, and I appreciate your time tonight. Um, so thank you. And we are going to circle back now uh, to Mr. Haynes, uh, who wanted to add some additional comments. Uh, however, Mr. Haynes, uh, I am going to ask that you limit your comments to two minutes. Uh, given the, the time of the evening, uh, we are surpassing 8.30 and we do have um, a limited time frame to get the remainder of our agenda in tonight. Uh, so, so if you could try and limit your comments to about two minutes, I would appreciate it. Uh, and sir, the floor is yours if you're still with us. I'm still here. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try my best to keep it two minutes, but I'm gonna say what needs to be said. In the sense that our last uh, demand for an arm, uh, anti-racist Midland, is that there needs to be a district-wide statement, community-wide statement, addressing the issue of racism in Midland public schools. As you can see tonight, there's a lot of pain in this community, a lot of trauma that's been caused by Midland Public Schools, facilitated um, traumatization and neglect for the welfares of dozens of black families, uh, as well as other people of color, students of color throughout the years. And ultimately change needs to come from the top. There needs to be a commitment and conviction of change. And honestly, that's a little hard to, uh, to facilitate and get rolling, which I can understand why DEI has been frustrated, especially when it comes from a superintendent uh, who as early as June 17th, Early, left a DEI meeting quite early on uh, to quote, go by a camper. And this comes after even his notable absence from the rally for racial justice, uh, as well as absence of uh, sub, several other uh, school board members. And so what needs to happen, I think, uh, and uh, uh, Arm would, what Arm would like to propose is a culture shift and a mental shift within the school board and the administration. Nothing is gonna change in this community until there's a stop, top down understanding the, the depth of the issue and a conviction to change and also acknowledge the ways that the school board, the administration, the district has failed people like me, my family, and so many other families on this call, individuals and students as they go off in the world. 
just as we've had several people over the, over the last few weeks uh, applaud ARM for the work that we've done and said they're really proud of the way the district has produced such strong leaders. But I can tell you now, there's just as many people here are vocal and uh, pushing for change. There's a lot of people that also Midland Public Schools produced, help produce, who are still full of ignorance and race and racism, to be honest. Um, and that's that's something that cannot be no longer be ignored. So what needs to happen is for the school board and the administration is the public admit the shortcomings, uh, humble ourselves uh, to admit that there has been a problem and we look like to solve the problem in a real and meaningful way. Uh, I believe this is the only way for, for community healing and improvement. And that can include a simple statement of shortcomings in the past racist issues, uh, receive the petition of demands, uh, and also some action points. I know it takes time to develop a real plan. There needs to be a quick and swift um, support for this community and commitment to change. I mean, there's a, real, there's a real reason every year, time and time again, we make national news about another MPS student who has uh, harmed another MPS student in regards to racial, uh, racial comments. And if that happens on a national level in the last few years, imagine what happens every day uh, for each and every student that goes to the Midland Public Schools. Uh, and so I wanna thank uh, you all for listening and thank Ms. Kornicki especially um, for the response um, that, sh that, sh that she shared today, uh, especially from the fact that, uh, as is demonstrated by her testimony, the, her, her son, in response to sharing her, his concerns, the, uh, the administration told him what he needed to do. Uh, in the same sense, Mr. McFarland, I know you didn't mean any harm by this, but when uh, Ms. Vargas shared her story, uh, your response was for her to be strong. But what needs to happen is instead of this reactionary proactive of talking to the people who are recipients of this racial harm, there needs to be a proactive uh, addressing of the people at the source of these, uh, of these issues. You don't have to tell us, people of color, people who know this is an issue, to be strong. That's something we're conditioned to do. My, I'm conditioned to do by going through the public schools and experience what I've experienced. And so what needs to happen is to talk to the people in the administration, talk to your fellow board members, administrators, teachers, and people who are on the ground in the classroom and get everyone on the same page. This is not response and action, this is not call for action for people of color and their allies to, uh, to change, but a call for the Midland Public Schools District culture and mentality change. And I wanna reiterate, the reason we're all here today is not because we wanna see Midland Public Schools burn, we wanna see it destroyed, anything like that. We're here because we believe in Midland Public Schools and the potential that so many good teachers like uh, uh, Ms. Meyer and Ms. King and Ms. Murphy who are here and thankful for the time today for people like them and many countless others who make Midland Public Schools worth coming to and really are, are at fighting for the students each and every day uh, against a lot of the, the, the obstacles that are put in the way. And so we're here because we believe in the potential of you and the school board and the administration to really facilitate meaningful, overdue, and longstanding sustainable change. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. We appreciate your additional comments. Is there anybody else who would like to address the board? Okay, we will then close the floor at this point. Um, and is there any, any comments um, by the board members, uh, I'll just open the floor to, to our board for a minute. Um, if there's anybody who would like to comment, uh, please feel free to do so. I'll make a comment if I could. Thank you, um, thank you to all the speakers who came out tonight and thank you for the leadership of this group. I promise you that my heart is in this. And uh, like Eric Krauss mentioned, I'm working to understand the history and the story of the black lives in Midland as well as in our country. Um, I think educating ourselves is very important. And I have uh, started down that path in, in doing that more intentional. And, um, but I agree that education is not enough. Action must follow. Um, I believe in the inclusion and diversity plan that MPS has put together. I, I feel it's a very important starting point and it's been very thoughtful. The pillars are very thoughtful and the foundation is important. Uh, is our work done? Absolutely not. This is, this is a journey and a journey that is going to take not only the board, not only the administration, not only the students, not only the parents, not only the community, it's all of us. And, you know, I am happy to lead. I'm not fearful of, of, of what might come back to us. I feel like we do need to move forward 
and the leadership this group has shown, whether it be on the street of Saginaw with all the supporters in Midland or tonight at this board meeting, it's, it's wonderful. I'm very proud of you and I'm a prou proud to be a part of this district. Um, but I believe that we need to do this together and we're going to be strong together. Uh, we have work ahead of us in this community and we want to make our district and our community a welcoming place for everybody. Um, when I hear stories and like we heard tonight from our friends um, that have been dealing with so many uh, uh, tough situations in our school, um, it's, it's embarrassing, it's, it's frustrating and, and it shows we need change. Um, but we need to stand together as community members and do this together. Truly, we need uh, a culture of genuine acceptance of others, of inclusion, of celebration, of validation. Um, together, we can, we can be better for everyone. Again, thank you for your leadership group that came tonight and spoke. A peaceful protest in our community was amazing. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of the young people in this community who have st stood up and really uh, brought this to the forefront of our community. I, I support you and I'll do what I can um, to support you in the future. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Pam. Um, very well said. And I will just add to that, um, you know, it's it's kind of beyond asking everybody else to stand up now. It's it's time for us to stand up um, as a district, as a board, and and be pioneers here and lead the way. So uh, we are prepared to do that. We are working down that road, um, but we do have a lot to learn, and, and there is a lot to unpack from tonight uh, in terms of the plan and, and demands and and how does all of that. Um, blend together. It, it, this is a, you know, like Mr. Uh, Haynes had mentioned, this is this is going to be a really long project. Uh, and it's got to be one that's done the right way so that it's sustainable and that it's workable and that it, it fits. Um, because, it, it, you know, to just rush into this isn't going to do anybody any good. Um, it, it, it's similarly kicking the can down the road and not doing anything isn't going to help either. So, um, we need. We are proactively working on this, um, and you know this was this was an eye-opening uh, session tonight. And I, and I just want to tell everybody I appreciate um, the time for those of. It looks like everybody's still with us, which is great. Um, I, you know, it was it was really nice to hear from everybody who opened up and who shared their experiences with us because uh, it, it was a hard thing to do. I could I could see that just by looking at at the faces. Um, you know, Laura, yours your experiences. Uh, reson will resonate with me for a while. Um, and, I, and I can't imagine having to go through that. You know, like Eric said, it, it's, it's tough and it's gonna hurt, right? This is, this is, this is a process that's gonna, it's gonna sting a little bit, um, but I'm ready for that. We're ready for that as a group. Our board is ready for that. Um, I'm confident in that much. Uh, so, so thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We do look forward to working with you. Um, if there's anyone else that, that has any comment, uh, please speak up. Um, we can't see any hands. I'd just like to Scott. say thank you to Garrett and to Becky and Kelly and Jennifer, Rachel, Lauren, Josiah, Cameron, Kofi, Josiah again, Jared, Afwa, Connor, Erica, Andrea, Laura, Eric, Amy, and Jonathan. It takes uh, takes a little bit of, uh, of of guts to stand up and to talk about some of these things. My hat's off to you for doing it today. I appreciate your help. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, I I've got pages of notes as well, and and, and I'm sure I'm like Brad and, and many other board members that are are trying to learn. Um, and, you know, reflecting on the last few weeks, it's been amazing to see our community stand up. Um, our family went to the march on, on Saginaw Road and, and participated and, and made our voices and our, our presence heard. 
Um, and it was inspiring. And I think, you know, even when my three-year-old reflects on it and starts asking questions, it shows that we can all learn, um, every single one of us. And, you know, recent op-eds in the paper by, paper by Ms. Gant and Mr. Haynes, you, you put one in, and then recent podcast by Mr. Chapman. And reflecting on some of these, it's, it's evident to me that we have an issue. Um, and the first step in fixing it is acknowledging it. Um, and, you know, additionally, all of the, the comments that we have heard tonight and, and previous allude to that and, and prove that. So thank you again for, for coming tonight and offering the help. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I've trying, trying to, to contextualize in my mind are, are some of the, the notes around really being a pioneer. Um, Mr. Griner had, had mentioned this earlier. And, you know, I think when, when we approach this from a place of attracting others to come into our community because they see us hold up this district as the fabric that makes the community a better place, we all get better because of it. And um, I truly believe that, that we can pioneer in the, in the space of, of uh, DEI for our district, just like we have in academics and, and, and producing exceptional students. So I look forward to the journey and, and commit to being part of the solution. Thanks, Phil. All right, if there are uh, no other comments, we're gonna close the floor and we are going to move on to uh, agenda, agenda item uh, 6.1. Um, so again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we're gonna move to 6.1 now. This is under the curriculum instruction and assessment. This is a textbook adoption and it's going to be uh, Ms. Miller Nelson. Good evening. Hi. Uh, we have for your information tonight, three resources that we're bringing for the 28 day public review and examination period. The first is a digital resource from McGraw Hill and that will be used in our accounting two courses in the district grades 10 through 12. The second is a textbook and a companion workbook that will be used in our IB German courses. And that is from Cambridge University Press. And the third is a resource, a text, or I'm sorry, an online resource supplemental that will be used for Spanish one, two, three, and survey of Spanish one, and survey of Spanish two in grades seven through 12. Uh, these are available for review in the curriculum office, the physical copies um, for the textbook and workbook, and we can provide digital access for those who wish to preview the online uh, resources. These will come back to you uh, in 28 days for your consideration for approval. Thank you very much, Penny, we appreciate it. Um, next up, we're in FFO, Finance Facilities and Operations. Um, this is uh, 7.1, uh, Mr. Bruton. Yes, sir, 7.1 for information. We have five gifts for you this evening, uh, totaling $3,906. Three of them are for our robotics teams and the other two, one was from Consumers Energy to help us offset some of the costs from running the shelter during flood relief time. And the other was from SK Communications for helping us offset some of our hotspot costs during the COVID-19 shutdown. And we certainly appreciate all of those gifts and we'll be acknowledging them in the credits this evening. And then if okay, I'll move to 7.2, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And then for action tonight, we need the board to accept a gift of $8,000. This was from United Dairy, and they have given us those monies to be able to help us with the costs associated during um, the COVID-19 shutdown for our food services. Okay. Thank you. I will take a, a motion for item 7.2, please. Make a motion to approve uh, 7.2 for $8,000. Support. support. Motion by Phil, support by Pam. Any discussion other than a big thank you to United Dairy for that? Um, that's a very generous gift. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
None. Okay. Motion passes. Uh, we will accept the $8,000 from United Dairy. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Next up, human resources. Uh, this is Mr. Jaster. Item 8.1. Is, is Mr. Jaster with us? Mm -hmm. I saw him earlier. Yeah, he's there. Yep. He's not, his mic's not on. I will take it from Mr. Jaster, Mr. Rutin. If it, um, we're, the board would like to extend its deepest sympathy to the family of <clears throat> Mrs. Jean Watt, who recently passed away. Mrs. Watt taught math and science at Central Middle School for 20 years, retiring in 2009. Mrs. Was, Watt was the recipient of the Gerstacker Award for Teaching Excellence in 2003. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, we appreciate that. Next up is item 9.1. This is just information regarding correspondence to and from the Board of Education that can be found listed on the agenda. Uh, next up is our scheduled remaining uh, board meetings for 2020, um, also listed on the agenda. Uh, final, final is the uh, study discussion session. Um, this is where we ask, are there any other board members that would like points of clarification on information discussed tonight or is there anything further that would uh, any board members would suggest that the administration study for our next meeting? Scott, I would just note you know, to our audience tonight of the next two board meetings, the DEI workshops for the board at 5 p.m. on each of those nights. Thank you, Phil. I, I appreciate that. Um, hearing nothing else, uh, we are going to turn the floor over to Mike for uh, his closing remarks. Yeah, I'll be very brief tonight. Um, tomorrow we wait the uh, governor's panel releasing the recommendation, the minimum rec recommendations to, for opening school in the fall. <clears throat> we do hope that allows for face-to-face -face instruction. There seems to be maybe a little bit of confusion out there that um, online is something we all desire, and that's not the case. Face-to-face -face is what we desire. Online is something we'll offer as an option for those who aren't comfortable um, coming to school during the COVID period. Um, so we plan to have both options. We yet to know what the governor's council minimum recommendation would be. We have multiple plans behind the scene ready to go, um, but we need that guidance before we issue anything out, out there. Um, on the DEI front, we have done a little bit of work um, after we have met with the, the alumni group, the ARM group, um, and we've been in contact with Truen on um, current judicial state of banning and policies of the Confederate flag. Um, we've received quite an um, extensive opinion and some background back to, for us that we'll work with through the board on that piece of it. So we are looking at that, as well as, you know, the two board workshops that Phil mentioned tonight, and um, Dr. Beasley and uh, Ms. Pen Penny Miller Nelson is uh, conducting several book studies with our administrative staff and um, eventually our teaching staff as we go forward. Um, I'm missing something out. The budget. How <laughs> could I miss that, right? And so proration seems to be getting of uh, the current budget getting further and further pushed out. It does not mean we're clear of that hurdle. So you know the process that that occurs. The state budget director has to issue a statement that a proration is needed. Once he does that, it triggers a minimum 30-day timeline for legislators and the governor to solve the problem. And so if you have recently have seen the legislators adjourned until the end of July, and so if that statement was issued, we're looking at the end of August, and our last state aid, aid payments delivered to us in the middle of September. So the likelihood of a proration is getting smaller and smaller for this current school year, but it could be put off into the next school year, affecting your future state aid payments. So not only did we build a budget tonight with a $750 per student cut um, for the expected uh, 2021 school year, we could have a possible reduction in there based on the 1920 year need for proration. So what Brian presented you could be worse, could be much better. And why that's all being delayed, obviously, is trying to give time for Washington, D.C. to give another bailout to the states, and we'll see if that occurs or not. So a lot left to do on that budget, and as you know, enrollment's a moving target as well, especially with COVID and especially with the um, tragic event we've had with the dam failures here in our community. So a lot of moving pieces there. We are working with 
um, other counterparts in the district and county on potential partnership with virtual schools, um, partnerships on sharing resources to reduce costs in our budgets to go forward. And we, you know, our, we presented a budget to you tonight that we've already made reductions on, um, and so that number will get significantly smaller, and those reductions so f will be so far away from the classroom no one will notice any difference, but we'll be ready to go. Mr. Jaster and a team of educators have been working on our reopening plan. Um, of course, that reopening plan is written down in chalk, so we can erase that real quickly depending on what the governor uh, will announce tomorrow. So stay tuned for more. Okay, Mike, uh, thank you very much. Um, everybody, thank you. I, I appreciate all of you and I appreciate your time tonight. Um, this was, uh, I think, a very excellent meeting and uh, there's a lot of takeaways here. So um, a lot to chew on as we move forward and uh, we're gonna do so progressively. So thank you everyone and we will see you next time. Um, we'll adjourn. Hey. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Let, let's get it. Yeah, forgot it, sorry. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Phil. Support. Support by Pam. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. We stand adjourned, everyone. Thank you very much.